Hello and a warm welcome to The Federal. I'm Neelu Vyas. Politics between Ahmadi Party and BJP is getting curiouser day by day. Developments happening at a feverish pace. First, Manish Sisodia gets arrested. Then come the resignations of Manish Sisodia and then Satendra Jain. And now, Congress leader, or rather for, uh, former MP Sandeep Dikshit, has written a letter to the Delhi LG asking him to prosecute Arvind Kejriwal, the Delhi Chief Minister, for the snooping case. Now, whether at all Kejriwal will be arrested or not, nobody knows for now. But does this move look like something towards annihilating Kejriwal? Do we see this as some kind of a monumental decline of the Ahmadbi Party? Uh, today, we have a very special guest, uh, Tavleen Singh, who is uh, the veteran author, columnist, writer. It's lovely to have you on the program, Tavleen. Uh, lovely to be here. Yeah, my pleasure, uh, Tavleen. But the first question I would uh, like to ask you is, of course, in context with what is happening in the politics of Delhi. Uh, do you see some kind of a design when... Uh, when uh, Sandeep Dikshit says that, you know, he should be booked under the Sedition Act, then Manish Sisodia gets arrested, then come the resignations. Or do you see some kind of a conspiracy or it's just a, a rather a political move? How would you see that? You know, there may be uh, something wrong in the, in the liquor deal in which all of this is being investigated. I'm right. actually on the side of privatizing, privatizing liquor shops. I don't think government should be running them in the first place. So I think that's what they were trying to do. And the allegation is that money has been made uh, by the, the people who got the shops, right? Now, as for this being a huge conspiracy to destabilize the Delhi government, it may not be a huge conspiracy, but it has destabilized the Delhi government. You know, you don't need to arrest the deputy chief minister of Delhi you can question him. When you arrest him and make a big deal about it, what is the message that you're sending? I mean, what is the information that they will be get that they will be able to get from him that he hasn't already given him? Secondly, is he a flight risk? No, he's recognizable. He won't be able to move. So there's and also, you know, you've got to look at this in the context of what's been happening too often since Modi became prime minister, which is that it's always the opposition that somehow has, you know, has to be investigated, right? So I, I think that somebody came up with figures that 85% of the cases, or, or maybe even 90% of the cases that have been filed by the ED and, and you know, CBI and all that, are all to do with opposition leaders. So that's a bit worrying. So, you know, I mean, are they trying to destabilize the Delhi government? We don't know, but they have succeeded in doing that. Right. Uh, but uh, as uh, Aam Aadmi Party says, they basically dismiss the snooping case as something which is uh, politically motivated. And uh, as their part of the justification, they say that some 163 cases were registered against the Aam Aadmi Party, out of which 134 cases have been dismissed. That's a figure which has been given by the Aam Aadmi Party. And for the rest of the cases, uh, BJP has not been able to produce any evidence. So what would you really say to the manner in which the central enforcement agencies are really working? The, the These agencies are working on the principle that the process is the punishment. So at one point when they wanted to go for Shah Rukh Khan for reasons that only they know about, they arrested his son for a month he was in jail, denied bail over what? Again, no flight risk, no capacity to, you know, to uh, damage the evidence or anything to interfere with the evidence. But the, the punishment was in the fact that this young kid was in jail for a year. Now, this, something similar is going to happen here. You continue to harass opposition politicians, weaken them, create the impression through the media that they're all corrupt. And, you know, I mean, it's that's the way it's working. It's not, you know, it, it's working to Modi's advantage so far. Let's see what happens. But 
how long can the BJP government uh, continue with this uh, ham-handed approach, Tavleen? Because uh, uh, when we, when a person like you or me, or for that matter, any journalist who's questioning the government on this pretext, we are questioning, we are doing our work. But uh, do we see the government hearing us? No. Uh, is there any respite in the court? Not immediately. So those are the answers which are there on the platter to, for everyone to see. But how long can the BJP government really continue with this? As long as Modi continues to win elections. As long as he has the popular approval that he so clearly has, he can do pretty much what he likes. Uh, there will be consequences. Um, we'll have to pay a heavy price for this kind of um, restrictive, illiberal democracy. But that time is not now. At the moment, Modi's approval ratings are 79%. When you go into, I, I don't know whether you do, but I wander about. And on my travels, I talk to people and they love him. They see nothing wrong with him. So, you know, he is uh, virtually in a state where he can do anything he likes. And he's doing it. But... If the approval ratings are <coughs> high, sorry, no, no, no problem. I'm saying if the approval ratings are as high as 79%, so why does he feel so insecure? I mean, in context with what is happening uh, with the Ahmadi Party, why <coughs> is this looking like something which is uh, which is almost in the direction of completely destroying Ahmadi Party, or for that matter, the brand Kejriwal? It's not so easy to destroy a political party once it exists. It, it really isn't so easy. Uh, what, what they're trying to do is malign it. And since it's a party that came up out of an anti-corruption movement, what they want to do is to keep reminding voters that it's not as uh, squeaky clean as, um, as they think. Okay. <clears throat> now, so, you know, but the point is that uh, it's actually, it's a double-edged um, method, because on the other hand, it gives Arvind Kejriwal the ability to say that the only person that Narendra Modi is scared of is him, and that mm. that's why he's being targeted particularly. But, you know, before right. that, there was the Rahul and Sonia were hauled in by the enforcement directorate. Um, yeah. I've actually covered this kind of, you know, misuse of these central intelligence agencies for a long time, and they've never been more misused. This is right. really, it, it, this government has taken it to a new level. Um, uh, sorry, right. go on. No, uh, I was saying that when you look at the politics revolving around this whole thing, and I'm really curious to know from you that uh, the kind of distance which Congress has maintained, and I was talking to a few leaders in Congress yesterday, where they said that the Aam Aadmi Party doesn't have the moral courage to seek help from other political parties because it grew, it sustained, it thrived on a campaign by calling sub parties chor hai, sub neta chor hai. That was the general refrain of Ahmadi party and that's how they have grown. Now, with what <clears throat> moral authority will he go and, I mean, walk up to them to seek for help? And when it comes to Congress, because people are questioning that why is Congress having a calibrated and a very measured response when it comes to Sisodia's arrest? So the Congress party says that when it was 2G, when it was a coal scam, uh, they called us thieves. So what, what do you That expect? was then. The Aam Aadmi Party has changed its core message since it started to rule Delhi. And its core message now is uh, healthcare and education. And it's because of that of, of them having improved those uh, things that the party continues to win in Delhi. And I yeah. think that the that the uh, BJP and the Congress are both very upset that you know Delhi and Punjab have they, they were not even a factor. Right. You know, I mean, they're not even they don't count anymore. So if Congress is attacking the Aam Aadmi Party. It's unwise, but the you know the the Aam Aadmi Party does not need anyone's help. The Aam Aadmi Party can handle this on its own. It doesn't need any help. 
you don't you don't feel tavleen that this is uh, probably the nemesis moment of uh, kejriwal because when congress says that uh, he must apologize uh, before the congress party i mean of course it's not going to happen that way but congress says that they he kejriwal must apologize because he lambasted the sheila dikshit government then he attacked uh, congress for the 2g for the coal scam so now it's time he stands up and apologizes Do you oh, see yeah. this and what about Rahul Gandhi apologizing for all the things that they have done what about Rahul Gandhi for instance just explaining um that the the, the national herald case how hmm. is it that the the uh, 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 political part the oldest political party's newspaper is suddenly become a, the, the private possession of three or four people Uh, all of whose surname is Gandhi, right? And it has huge assets. It's got, so you know, are they going to apologize for that? Are they going to say that the and, and they made a real drama, as you know, when Sonia and and Rahul were questioned. So none of them can afford to talk when it comes to these things. Uh, Narendra Modi has managed, however he has done it, we don't know, but he has managed to keep all the mudslinging. away from him personally so even with the recent adani thing it hasn't damaged him personally and you know my own feeling is that adani is not going to be an issue in the next election why um, do you think so that adani will not be an issue um <clears throat> just judging from the conversations that i've had with uh, the aam aadmi um okay. they are very very um, taken by the fact they don't know much about for instance g20 they yeah. think that g20 is going to be a way of money coming into india as investment but they th- think that the, that the that the prime minister of india is now already the vishwaguru the prime minister of the world and they like all these foreigners coming here so that's one reason secondly there has been work on the ground do you know in my own little village in which i live there are already uh, the jal jeevan mission has arrived there's never been water in that village for the past 75 years for one right. reason or another but there is water being you know being provided there are gas cylinders being given there are toilets being built there you know i mean he has done better than most prime ministers have where all this is concerned so you know that's going to be his his message uh but uh, by the way uh, the adani hindenburg report uh, i mean the the kind of irregularity which uh, the hindenburg report has pointed out you feel that it's not going to resonate uh, uh, amongst the people i mean the common man even if uh, the opposition raises the heat on this <clears throat> for a start the opposition has very little credibility where all this is concerned um you may be too young to remember it but you know in in the bofors case um the money was actually traced to traced to swiss bank accounts that were owned by sonia gandhi's two best friends uh she never bothered to explain that um the, one of the last things that manmohan singh did before giving up office in 2013 or whatever <clears throat> was to free uh, a bank account that had been sealed in which there was bofors money and that went to those same friends so who is going to do that secondly bofors was a big issue in the 1989 election big issue because uh, for a start rajiv gandhi nobody expected that rajiv gandhi would be involved personally or that his family would get drawn into taking bribes in an arms deal so it was a big issue then but in the next elections that have come bofors has disappeared as have you know i don't think the national herald thing is going to be an issue when people talk about corruption they're talking about corruption all the way down the line where they have to pay someone or the other for something for for just basic services you know so adani most people don't even understand what he's done you know right what is 
Right. But this narrative of uh, proximity between the Prime Minister and Gautam Adani, how sovereign guarantees uh, were given uh, to the other countries, and uh, the way the stock valuations have been spiked up. Now, when this is being explained to the common man by the opposition, maybe in a very uh, common man man's uh, parlance, don't you think this issue can resonate or may resonate? I'm just trying to understand this. Well, well, I, I, I personally don't think so. And they've been calling Wolf too long. Right. From the very first election, meaning from 2014, oh. two men have gone on about Ambani Adani. One of them was Rahul Gandhi and the other was Arvind Kejriwal. I remember a meeting in Banaras, almost Kejriwal's first meeting. There must have been 20 people in a little gully. And he hmm. kept on saying, yes, sab Adani ka paisa hai, Ambani ka paisa. So they've said it too often. You know, hmm. Adani has his problems and Adani will deal with them himself. Obviously, if the if because of what has happened, the, the stock market crashes and it harms the economy and ordinary, um, you know, people who invested in the stock market are hurt, then it will make a difference. So... What is your feeling about 2024? Is it going to be uh, is it going to be in BJP's favor and opposition is not seen anywhere even near? Well, you know, I don't like ever to um, to make that kind of uh, prediction <clears throat> because in 2013 or actually in 2012, had would you have believed that Narendra Modi would be prime minister? No. I mean, even in 2019, uh, the Gandhi family was so sure that they were going to come back that they act Sonia actually said, we won't let him come back. And Rahul Gandhi had that huge campaign of Rafal and Chokidar Chor hai, et cetera. And he comes back with more seats than before. Now, what I have noticed in the voters recently is that they are very aware of what they can get out of a government. They don't no longer vote just because somebody looks charismatic or comes from some grand family or anything like that. What they see in Modi is a man who has nothing else to do but to work for India. He has no family. He, do, he doesn't take a holiday. And every day you see him somewhere or the other working and people like that. So, you know, I mean, if there's going to be a challenge um, you, you're going to have to have a charismatic leader from the opposition who who can take him on personally, because it's going to be very much an election about Modi. Common man sees Modi as a powerful force. But what about the political competitors who say that, you know, the, the institutions have been hijacked? The court also seems to be in favor of the government. All these kinds of allegations when they come up. Uh, how much of this issue, and also about the media freedom, that how there's no uh, media freedom at all, uh, the channels almost are falling, uh, you know, on the side of the government. So what would you really say to this? Uh, uh, I don't think it affects voters. Okay. It's not something that that is the first thing on their mind, that some journalists have been locked up or, you know, some have been not allowed to get their visas renewed, etc., uh, I don't think that that is ever going to become a political issue in an election. Uh, what will make the difference is if suddenly we have an economic collapse, uh, then it will be easier for you know the opposition to to give him um, a competition. But as I said, I don't like to predict these things. Every time I've done it, I've got it wrong. I predicted that Atalji was undefeatable in 2004. And I said that on CNN. So it's on tape. So I'm not going to make any predictions here. I think that the whole beauty about democracies is that you don't really know what's going to happen till it happens. No, but what, what I'm curious about is the fact that shouldn't the media be questioning the government? Of course, it's not a political issue with a common man, but the media doesn't raise its questions as to why the institutions are hijacked by the government, why 
the channels are being bought over, the way advertisements are being doled out to, to silence the media. Media almost has stopped questioning Modi. I mean, look at the mainstream media. Uh, because oh, anyone who questions Modi gets into trouble. So the media, it's true, is more docile than it's ever been before. Because, the you know, how many, um, how many journalists are rich enough to fight court cases against the ED, right? And if they bring those charges, and if we know already, which we do know, that the process is itself the punishment. So by the time you've proved that you, I mean, look what happened with Sadiq Kappan. There were no charges against him. Hmm. He was in jail for two years. Um, Omar Khaled, he's a student leader. He's been in jail for two years because they, they're using anti-terrorism laws against the media. So, you know, it's not easy to fight that. But uh, what would you really say to the democratic ideals uh, as far as the Modi regime is concerned? Uh, is he really, does he really seem to be bothered at all about the democratic ideals? Is he really bothered to save democracy? Because these are all the parameters on which you judge how, how democratic a country is. Okay, no. Uh, we, we mustn't be melodramatic, okay? Democracy has survived in India because the people wanted to survive. When you had one prime minister who decided to suspend it, they threw her out without, you know, a chance. So if democratic rights uh, begin to be suspended for ordinary people, it becomes a big thing. Where the media is concerned, the media really is trying in its way to, to tell the truth about certain things, but it isn't easy for very obvious reasons. And But, but let me tell you something, that under Sonia Gandhi's benign rule, um, it was just as bad. You know, it uh, she uh, targeted people, I don't want to go into the details because it involves me personally, she targeted people who criticized her and if they didn't lose their jobs, they ended up, people around them ended up getting very seriously hurt. So, you know, it's nothing that new, nor is it new that the CBI and the ED are controlled by the, you know, the, it's always been that way. What the BJP is doing is playing from the Congress playbook and playing the hard ball. More aggressively. Yeah. Uh but Evelyn, uh, I mean, the way the things are right now, and especially on the political landscape, uh, do you really see any semblance of an opposition unity coming, uh, you know, for 2024? A lot of talk is happening, uh, but all are in different directions. Congress seems to be in a different direction. Then you have parties like Ahmadmi Party, Trinamool, and BRS in a different direction. Uh, can there be an opposition unity for 2024 or... It's it all looks like a very uh, loose ended talk. Um, there can be no opposition challenge without the Congress Party because the only party in India that is truly a national party, other than the BJP, is the Congress. Uh, these others, are, you know, the Trinamool. It would be a real miracle if Mamta ended up as prime minister. There would have to be all kinds of permutations and equations, etc. I'm not saying that can't happen, but if the Congress party manages to rebuild its infrastructure, you know, because what they've done so far, their most successful event has been the Bharat Jodo Yatra. And after that, they've done nothing to build up on what they achieved. So, you know, unless they can actually... Uh, and, you know, I mean, they, they they had a huge infrastructure right down to rural India, which is in shambles. So, you know, I mean, if they if they can rebuild it, if Rahul Gandhi or somebody emerges as a credible leader, then they have a chance. But this opposition unity, the whole, you know, the kind of mixture, like a kind of, you know, kitchery type thing. That could well happen, but it can't happen without Congress. But uh, Congress did try to put a roadmap uh, in the recent uh, Raipur plenary session, saying that some historic amendments have taken place as far as the Congress constitution is concerned. Then they are saying that... Uh, what are these they... historic amendments? 
some 85 amendments saying that they will give 50% reservation to the SCs, STs, OBCs, women, youth, all those things, you know, those amendments, which apparently will revive the party. Then 50 under 50, where uh, there'll be reservation for people under 50 also, they will have party positions. That so was what's one amendment. New? This, is, this is the old playbook, no? This is the old playbook. Secondly, when you say you're going to give 50% reservations, to where's the money going to come from? All right. Um, are taxpayers going to be happy for to pay for other people you know, to have reservations? Um, it's a, it's not it's not an easy thing to implement. These are um, political illusions that they create when elections come around. You know, um, I wouldn't I wouldn't put any faith in them. And basically, what I would like to see is, for instance, in my village. There is, I live in Maharashtra. There is Shiv Sena. There is um, other little local parties. And there's the BJP. There's no Congress party left. And the whole Sarpanch and the Panchayat used to be Congress. They've, mm -hmm. they've got to rebuild from the bottom. And I don't see that happening yet. But uh, Congress uh, don't, I mean, especially after the Bharat Jodo Yatra, but you did say that the Congress doesn't seem to be building on the gains of Bharat Jodo Yatra. Uh, so how, I mean, are you not convinced with the kind of roadmap they have uh, uh, put out? They are saying that they will, if they are voted back to power, they will bring in a law on hate crimes. There'll be no discrimination on the basis of caste, gender, all that. Don't take you know, all this seriously. They, you know, for a start, none of the things they ever say at these uh, meetings actually get implemented. This is just, you know, the, the Congress Party's bureaucracy, you know, bringing out these papers, etc. Why did they not? I'll give you an example. Where the Bharat Jodo Yatra has gone in the villages that it went through, are there now little cells already started saying Bharat Jodo Yatra, please come and help us. We are trying to rebuild the Congress Party. There isn't. There's nothing. They just swept through the country from Kanyakumari to Kashmir with Rahul Gandhi proving that he's very fit and good for him for that. But, yeah. you know, he, he's not going to be a gym instructor. He's trying to be prime minister. So you need more than just fitness, physical well, fitness. Yeah, I mean, uh, the, the lines which you used, they're quite uh, hilarious and at the same time, very powerful and potent also. But uh, what about Rahul Gandhi? Do you really see any hope in him? Uh, will he be, uh, can he be a competitor to Narendra Modi? Because always the talk is that probably Congress will project Rahul Gandhi uh, when it comes to fighting a battle against Modi. Do you see him anywhere near Modi? Uh, at the moment, he cannot be um, the alternative because he still talks like a schoolboy. Do you know okay. the charges that he makes? Mm -hmm. he, he takes a serious issue and trivializes it somehow. I mean, he, he takes the most serious issue and, and, and just makes a little joke out of it because, you know, he is incapable of taking, and he takes on too many things, you know, suddenly he's talking about the Sanatan Dharma and what it stands for and all this sort of business and saying, you know, that he knows more, go and read the Vedas, he said the other day. You know, I mean, the people he's up against have not only read them, they know them, that's their whole, you know, their culture, it's what they believe in. So, you know, I find that I haven't actually heard him make uh, a speech that I would consider uh, the speech of an adult politician trying to become prime minister. I haven't heard a speech like that. But the undertone of the entire Bharat Jodo Yatra was to fight the communal atmosphere. There was so much of Hindu and Muslim happening. He was talking about brotherhood. He was talking about harmony. Now, was that not something which was quite palatable to the people and they could have built on this uh, uh, on this uh, tone, which was there for Bharat Jodo Yatra? They should build on it. Okay. They should concentrate. Instead of, you know, 85 new ideas, they should have five new ideas. By the way, the Congress Party hasn't had a new idea in 75 years. You know, mm -hmm. no, I'm, I exaggerate. But certainly since Narsimha Rao became prime minister and ended the license Raj, they haven't 
add a new idea. Okay, so they go on about, oh, my daddy did this, and you know, my daddy, my father did that. I mean, you just should hear the speeches that uh, Priyanka and Rahul made. People, the, most of the voters weren't even born then. They have no interest in that. Hmm. You know, I mean, so to go on and on about the past, it's as absurd as the BJP going on, for instance, in Karnataka about Hanuman and Tipu yes. Sultan. You know, if you just look at it from a distance, it looks as though the election is between Hanuman and Tipu Sultan. <laughs> <laughs> How absurd is that? Yes. Okay. So, but yeah, but no, they no, are in, no, they are in a good position to build on that idea that we stand for Hindus and Muslims having equal rights. You know. Right. And we will. We think that they are that they're discriminating. They should have a huge campaign about the cow vigilantes who have killed off people. You know, if they did that, if they made those people who were killed into proper heroes, people's houses who've been demolished, bring up those things, and then you get to to the common man. Uh but as you said that rahul gandhi still looks like a schoolboy he's uh, he he's inconsistent with whatever he says he talks like a schoolboy he looks like an old man now but he talks he looks <laughs> like an old hobo but he talks like a schoolboy huh? right but if he's talking like a schoolboy so you we don't you don't see him as a very serious politician so who else in congress apart from rahul gandhi do you see anybody who inspires confidence in in congress right now the way the things are now under the new Congress president, Malikarjun Kharge. Okay. Uh, for me, Kharge is, is nothing, you know, I mean, irrelevant. What uh, you must understand is that in the 10 years that Sonia Gandhi was de facto prime minister, she made sure that the party was really a party of political heirs. They all have children who they want to put into politics. Chidambaram's son is in politics. Kharge's son is in politics. Every person in the Congress party is literally just a political heir. Now, the thing with political heirs is they can win one election or two, but they can never do the real work because they haven't been thrown up by a political movement or a political idea. So, you know, the Congress party has much repairing to do. And I don't see any of these guys, where are the young people in the Congress party? I mean, yeah. you look at all those oldies, you know, sitting at the, I mean, I'm not uh, so young myself, so they're going to say that who is she to talk? But the fact is that you need a political party that is, you know, attracting younger people. The BJP is all their little, you know, the poll level. But look at Congress, Tavlin, don't you think that everything in Congress revolves around the Gandhi family, whether one likes it or yes. not, is the Gandhi family, which is binding the whole party. So it's no. all about... No, 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 that's a mistake. Huh? Why? Uh, okay, yeah. Don't, don't go by that. They think that they are the, the glue that holds the party together, but they haven't mean much, the glue is not working. They've lost so many people in the past two years. Yeah. So that means that that glue has weakened. That glue worked when Sonia Gandhi could win you 150 seats. When Rah in Rahul Gandhi's name, you could win 200 seats. They don't have that appeal left anymore. So what they really need to do is to stop being a little Darbari court outside Sonia Gandhi's house and really make the party, allow in people, younger people from all over who want to join politics and who don't like the BJP's kind of politics. I don't see any effort of that kind going on. Right. But uh, uh, don't you feel that for 2024, Congress might do uh, better than what they did in 2019? Do you have any hope? <laughs> it's a very low bar. <laughs> I think they have 50 seats, right? Uh, they went up six seats between 2014 and 2019, which is really, I mean, I, it's I, I, when I saw that, I could hardly believe it. But, um, you know, so if they get from 50, will they go up to 60? Yes, that's possible. You know, and if they can go up to 100, then they, you know, then they then they're a factor. But where are they going to get those seats? 
where where you know uh, again you don't see that all you have is you know these kind of bozos speaking on behalf of rahul gandhi speaking very grandly about you know we're going to do this and we're going to there isn't any action on the ground uh, one last question, Tavleen, before I wind up the interview. That uh, So you feel finally that there is no alternative to Modi and people will have to live up to the authoritarian ways and manners in which the government is conducting itself? Um, no, I'm, I'm a very optimistic person. And I believe that when there is too much power um, in one individual, um, that 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 it implodes, that it starts to dissipate in its own fashion. And I'm actually still hopeful that there will be a political party and maybe even a political leader who will be able to take him on in 2024. We need it. We we really do need that. Okay. Thank you, Zavlin. It was wonderful having you on the program. And one appeal to the viewers who are watching The Federal, please share this interview as widely as you can. Subscribe to our channel and send us your feedback. Thank you, Tavleen, once again. It was a pleasure having you. Thank you. Thank you. Subscribe to The Federal's YouTube page for more interesting updates.